Hi, everybody. I'm Karen Thayer. I'm the founder and CEO of Fertility Planet, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to Fertility Planet New York. Um, so whether you're here in person or watching from online, um, we welcome you to join the conversation with us on Twitter using hashtag FP13NY. Um, why am I standing in front of you here today? I'll tell you that I never expected to be in the position that I'm in today. Um, the only reason I'm here is because I personally went through a very, very long struggle and journey to becoming a parent, filled with more challenges and struggles than I ever, ever could have imagined. Um, certainly, I never would have imagined this for myself when I was growing up. Um, you know, it took me uh, several years of IVF <laughs> before I finally realized that, um, well, let me just go back for a minute. <laughs> in, in all of those years that I struggled, I just, um, I found it really easy to feel very badly about myself. It was amazing how easy it was for me to find reasons to be frustrated with my body, frustrated with my situation, frustrated with everything to do with this process of trying to have a child. And it took me several years of you know, failed IVF and fertility treatments to finally decide that I was done feeling badly about myself. I didn't want to feel that way anymore. And at the same time, I also realized, um, you know, it just dawned on me that there really isn't one right path to becoming a parent. I think I was very fixated on doing this one way. And it took me, you know, lots of disappointments and failed results to realize that there were probably many, many more ways in which I could try and become a parent. And that's what really, you know, dawned on me is that it was really important to me to become a parent, not necessarily to be pregnant. So um, in, d in realizing that, um, I decided that, you know, how am I going to stop feeling badly about myself? Well, for me, that it, it occurred to me that I was so far in this process very much feeling like a victim and that if I wanted to uh, feel better, that I should try and get as healthy as possible and to feel as strong as possible, you know, in mind, in body, and in spirit. So I was looking for all the different ways I could do that. And um, I remember thinking to myself, well, if I just feel healthier and stronger, then maybe navigating through all the choices in front of me, you know, maybe I will be able to make decisions with, with more strength and with more ease. And that's really what I started focusing on, is finding a place within myself where I could sort of understand what was happening to me and be a partner in the process rather than feel so victimized. For example, I remember I was living in Europe for a long time as a journalist, and I was, you know, in Denmark for my IVF treatments in Copenhagen, and it was December, and it was freezing cold, and I remember walking across the snow on this frozen lake um, on my way to my egg retrieval for IVF <laughs> by myself, and on my iPod was Tony Robbins. So listening to Tony Robbins in the freezing cold in Copenhagen was my desperate attempt to feel more grounded and strong, and I only wish at that moment that I had known about Tara Styles. I, uh, you know, I can't imagine a more inspiring person to open Fertility Planet with us than Tara Stiles. Um, she's a total hero to me. She's been named uh, Yoga Rebel by the New York Times. She's the founder and owner of Strala Yoga, together with her husband, Mike Taylor, who's here with us today. Um, she's the author of best-selling books. She's created a whole lot of amazing content right, online. You. She's the author of several, um, she's created a lot of DVD series with partners like Jane Fonda and Deepak Chopra and Elle Magazine. And uh, today she's gonna be talking with us together with Mike about how to achieve your most radiant self from the inside out. So please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Tara Stiles and Mike Taylor. Uh, before we get started, uh, all the stuff that Karen was talking about, about being stuck and feeling a victim and just not feeling good in our bodies, I think that applies to, you know, whatever is going on in our lives, whether it's dealing with fertility, dealing with being a parent, or just dealing with being a person in our lives. So I think before we get started talking and sort of analyzing and getting into our heads a bit, we can get into our bodies and feel better. And so let's stand up. We'll do a little bit of yoga. <laughs> don't worry, you don't have to have your stretchy pants on. And, uh, and we'll feel good, all right? <laughs> Thanks for coming. Okay, so just stand nice and comfortable here, like easy knees, easy body. And just for a moment here, close your eyes and let your attention shift a bit deeper inward. Let me see if you can soften your knees a bit here, relax your head and neck and shoulders. And maybe even allow yourself to simply shift and drift around a little side to side and softly forward and back. 
finding that nice movement that lives inside balance, flowing through your body. So you let them through their arms, making it just easy. And take a big inhale, float your arms all bent up over your head. The top, close your eyes, bring your palms together, bring your thumbs right up into your heartbeat. And just simply settling in here for a moment. And see if you can find your heart pumping for you. All together, take a big inhale up through your nose. And easy exhale out through your mouth. Two more times, big inhale. And easy exhale. One more time, big inhale. And easy exhale. Gently relax your hands down by your sides and open your eyes. <laughs> Take a big inhale, float your arms all bent and up. This time, grab a hold of your right wrist with your left hand. Just soften through your knees. Big inhale, stretch all the way up so much that maybe you start to topple over to your left side. Yeah, and it's okay to kind of move around a little bit here. There's no rules that say you have to be stuck in a pose and be in some perfect idea here. And when you're ready, all the way back up to the middle. Nice, same other side. Grab a hold of your left wrist. Stretch right up and maybe a little bit over to the side. Just breathe and easy. <laughs> And then when you're ready, all the way back up to your middle here. And we'll just step your feet a little bit apart. We'll do some mini warriors. <laughs> so turn your left toes out to the left a bit. Right toes, just come a little bit in. And just sink through your hips a bit here. Let your arms float out to your sides. And just easy gaze over your left fingers. So just breathing here for a few moments. Yeah, you're all perfect warriors. <laughs> the great thing about yoga is it looks different on every body. So there's no perfect. The only perfect is to stay with yourself and breathe easy. Nice, take a big and inhale, lift your hips, lift your arms. And then as you exhale, soften right back into it. Two more times here. Big inhale, lift everything all the way up. Nice. And then exhale, soften and relax. One more time here. Big inhale, lift up. And then we'll just warrior around to the other side. So turn in your right toes out to the other side. Left toes come a little bit in. Just soften in here. Again, staying easy in your body. Maybe even swaying a little side to side. Yeah, awesome. Here, here. Take a big inhale, lift everything right up. You got it. <laughs> and then exhale, soften and relax. Two more times here, big inhale, lifts you right up. And then exhale, soften and relax. One more time here, big inhale, lifts you right up. And then as you exhale, soften and relax. Yeah, big inhale, lift everything all the way up. And just scoot your feet a little bit together here. Just do a little, little tree pose. So bring your left toes on the ground here, just so your bottom of your foot is just rested into your leg there, yeah. So great thing about trees is they're all different. <laughs> no, two, no two trees the same. Take a big and I'll float your arms all the way up and just soften here. Maybe even close your eyes here. So that changes the experience a little bit. Maybe you feel a little wobbly. It gets windy sometimes. <laughs> he's my Uncle Norm's favorite pose. He runs our family farm. He does trees when he's waiting for the fields to grow. <laughs> this corn dance. <laughs> and then when you're ready, just come back to the middle. And same thing, other side. Just bring your right toes in. Just relax there. And big inhale, lift everything all the way up. That's okay. Branches intersect. <laughs> and we sway a little side to side here. Just a few breaths. And then when you're ready, relax out of this one here. So one more time. Big inhale, lift everything all the way up. Plant your palms together. Bring your thumbs right back into your heartbeat here. And again, just settling in here for a moment. Just really easy in your body. Just maybe allowing yourself to simply shift and drift around a little side to side or softly forward and back. Just real easy in your body and ready for anything. And all together, big inhale up through your nose. And easy exhale out through your mouth. Two more times, big inhale. And easy exhale. One more time, big inhale. And easy exhale. And when you're ready, gently open your eyes. Yeah, morning yoga done. That was easy, right? <laughs> Don't even have to put your foot behind your head or a handstand or anything. Yeah. Ah, oh, you guys did great. Cool. Okay, all right. So we can talk about some ease a little bit more now that we did so. <laughs> it's always good to do what you want to talk about, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so let's see what we got here. I talk a lot about making your own rules, and a lot of people have a lot of different interpretations of that. Some people think making your own rules you know, involves coming in on a Harley and wearing a leather jacket and just being a crazy person, really. <laughs> but when you think about making your own rules, it's really the practice of finding your own intuition, becoming connected to yourself, 
and really taking that centerpiece of your life and then moving out from there. So it's the practice of sort of letting go of all the external distractions and coming back to finding yourself. So I like to say, make your own rules, break your own rules, except when it comes to traffic lights because you want to pay attention to those. <laughs> Do you have anything about rule making and breaking? I know I've, I've seen this uh, make your own rules uh, sign 50 stories above Tokyo. I've seen it on some clothes that you designed with Reebok. We saw it originally, I think, in that New York Times article on the front page that followed you around. So, um, and, and it just seems like uh, at the studio, because we have uh, people everywhere doing Strala, and then we have the studio here in New York, Everyone seems to just really attach to that because you've come into a very traditional world that was really based around rules and said, hey, um, I, I think there's a better way to do this. Actually not following what a guru or what anyone tells you to do, but actually follow how you feel. And I think that's what's made your message uh, part of it so powerful. Yeah, so uh, I'm working on a new book. It's about food, but I think it's you know, seeing having a yoga studio for so long and, you know, just dealing with people with all kinds of different experiences and problems and good things that happen in their lives, food seems to be a big element of, again, control or something that's a little bit off or something that we need to find a little bit more ease in. And it obviously relates to health and wellness and just how we, how we treat ourselves and how we think about ourselves. So I just want to read a little bit of something about Make Your Own Rules that's uh, part of this book that's coming out next year. Who made the rules that govern our lives and why are we following them? When you put yourself in the position of a follower, you're at the back of a long line, waiting for a golden ticket that's bound to be counterfeit. You end up empty-handed, time-wasted, and more frustrated than when you stepped in line. When you follow someone else's rules, you'll never catch up to yourself. It's just someone else's rules. Sound familiar? <laughs> We've all signed up for diets, diet plans, systems, products, and piles of stuff that promise to change our bodies, minds, and lives for the better. The pile ends up collecting dust in a corner, and we remain in the system finding the next fix. Sure, there's value in experimenting and finding inspiration, but when following someone else's rules leads us further away from ourselves, we start swimming in dangerous territory. We chase the external and grasp at the next best thing that never lives up to its promise. We end up more frustrated than when we started. We begin to think of ourselves as failing. We messed up that diet. We dropped the ball in that big plan. But there's a very important secret here. We've never actually failed ourselves. We've proven only once again that other people's rules and other people's footsteps simply belong to other people. <laughs> and let's not ignore all the rules that we place on ourselves. Our own rules are the most restrictive. Expectations, pressures, and judgments can aim at us from within. We don't even need other people and external circumstances to feel bad about ourselves. We start out life full of zest, inspiration, and big open ideas about what we, could, what we would like to do and experience during our time here. Along the way, we find ways to block ourselves from our dreams and our desires. We build walls, form bubbles, and make rules that hold us back from living happy, healthy, and radiant lives. When we block ourselves with pressures and judgments, our desires don't just fade away. They morph into tension globs and linger somewhere unwanted. All that energy has to go somewhere. Morph desires develop into physical and mental tension, coupled with frustration and disease. Agitation surrounds us and soaks us way into our skin, making itself comfortable while making us incredibly uncomfortable. We run out of room to breathe, feel, think, and be ourselves. We get backed into a corner with no space to breathe. Before we even see it coming, an unwanted house guest in our most sacred home, our own skin, drives our stress levels way up and turns us into angry, frustrated tension ball spinning out of control. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> it happens, right? When we start to believe that it's possible to step out of the follower position, how do we begin to find what rules work for us? So this idea of that pushing and forcing isn't necessary. It rarely leads to the result you think you want. It's a common misconception that you have to work hard to break down walls to reach your goal. Finding the ease isn't about doing nothing or being lazy. It's about moving with ease with the least amount of effort. You'll still get the workout if you're doing yoga without clenching your booty or your arms in a pose. <laughs> you'll actually be doing a whole lot more with a lot less effort, and you'll be calm instead of tense and frazzled. So, you want to talk about yeah, that? Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, part of my role at Strala is I get to get all of the mail that comes in for Tara, and she can't handle it all. But you know, some of it is physical mail. Some of it is from people in Japan sending us emails or 
uh, from Africa or all over the North American continent. And I think there are three major principles that people are writing in about that they use really well in their own lives. Um, the first of these being make your own rules. And, and they're talking about amazing things. Um, you know, I studied mind-body medicine at Harvard and Oxford and ended up not pursuing uh, a, a full degree in practicing medicine because I had a really tough time with uh, the way Western medicine was um, struggling with a lot of the things that mattered to me, things like chronic pain, chronic disease, obesity, um, things that we're really finding very challenging uh, to help people with. And what we started hearing from people everywhere is they were helping themselves. It turned out that they, they didn't always need um, you know, a doctor alongside them every, every step of the way, but they needed themselves alongside of them every step of the way. And somehow picking up on your message and on Strala, whether it was on television or online or with videos, they were managing to cure incurables. They were managing to figure out how to deal with chronic pain and, and chronic disease in ways that they had never been able to before. And that first principle of make your own rules seems to have, have really helped. Do you want to say a little bit more about how people have put that into practice, like what does that look like? Sure, it's, it's really neat because you know we have a yoga studio and I make yoga videos and you know cooking and things like that, everything that relates into wellness and when you throw out these ideas in different modalities, you know you don't have to be practicing at a yoga studio for three hours every day to be making your own rules. You don't have to be you know, a vegan chef to be making your own rules. People have really taken these principles, whether they see a yoga video or they see a, you know, a cooking video and they take it into their lives and they say, okay, how can I live my life with a little bit more ease and how can I really be in charge of making my own decisions? So it's neat. We see people just inventing all sorts of things that are really unique and creative, whether it's a new fitness routine they do for themselves or a new meditation they just decide works for them every day. And it's really coming from this place of within. It's not, um, you know, we've all have the, you know, the books piled around of everything that's telling us to do from, you know, Tony Robbins' 10 steps, which I'm sure are like really wonderful to, uh, you know, Deepak's steps and, you know, all of my friends are a lot of self-help writers and, and these are great for inspiration, but sometimes, you know, we can get kind of buried underneath them in a way and all the self-help books pile up and where are we in all of this so it's really interesting to to just toss it back onto these people it's it's really nice to see people come into the studio and they they come up and they're like oh my life feels good I, I feel changed I feel easy because I'm finding this ease in my body and uh, you know the one the one of the policies we have with the studio if somebody comes up and says you know you changed my life we say oh no no I didn't do anything like you know, we call ourselves guides instead of teachers because uh, we feel you know the same as you climb a mountain Mike, Mike's a mountain climber so I always use this analogy but if you're climbing a mountain with a guide the guide isn't um, climbing it for you they're maybe showing you where to put your foot and where to you know grab the ice and where not to grab the ice but we feel that way with what we do you know we're not transmitting you know some spiritual energy power that you don't have for yourself I mean the way that we see everybody is everybody has the same amount of incredible power within to do anything they want in their lives whether they want to live a tense life or whether they want to live a life filled with ease and creativity so when somebody comes to me and says wow you changed my life I said I didn't I didn't do anything like maybe I put a video on YouTube or maybe I've been you know working with you at the studio and noticing you know maybe you put your foot there and it was going to hurt your knee and then it opened up a whole new possibilities for you. So so we're seeing a range of people, you know, getting more exploratory in the kitchen, really getting confident in places they weren't confident before and and having a lot of fun. I think that's um, one of the one of the missteps along the way in a wellness path of it's just no fun, you know, we got to be, you know, doing it this way and having it be this way and here's all the rules, but, you know, who made up those rules? So we can just start over and, and make our own rules. I think you're right. It's, uh, it, it gets to be addictive in a way. Once you take that first step of realizing, ah, I, I thought when I walked into a yoga studio that there was one right way to do things and someone would correct me if I uh, strayed too far and you know, they, they start to come in and they work with you and they're like, oh wow, no one's correcting me, no one's fixing me. They're telling me there's nothing wrong with me. And suddenly you're like, I can actually make my own rules. And the neat thing about yoga is when you first discover that, whether it's in yoga or in, in anything else you do, 
that first place that you discover that it's okay, you know, the seven step plan, like you said, that can inspire you. Friends, everyone around you can inspire and support you, but eventually we have to get there on our own two feet from what we actually do. So if you have a safe place like yoga to first figure out that ah, it's, it's okay and actually the results are really good when I start making my own rules, then suddenly it takes off and I think that's why we get so much mail from everyone doing all these great things. So the, the second principle that I think comes up a lot, and people talk about finding the ease. And sometimes people are, find that a little confusing. They're like, oh, what do you mean finding the ease? Does that mean I should just be lazy? Does that mean I shouldn't have any goals? Uh, is it that uh, everything uh, is just easy and if anything is hard, I shouldn't do it? Um, so if you could maybe explain what this ease is that you're talking about. Sure, I think uh, there's a lot to it. It's really not just, you know, lying on the floor like a, like a sack of potatoes and saying, okay, I'm at ease, <laughs> you know, or what's happening, everything's good. But really find this way to work efficiently with your own body and find your own rhythm. And, and what that means uh, for me is getting sensitized. So if you become sensitized, you start to feel your body. And if you practice not feeling, if you practice doing what, you know, you think you should and taking all the supplements you think you should and doing all these things that just because you think you should, you're really Really practicing creating this giant wall between yourself and yourself so you're, you're cut off you're desensitized from yourself and you know we see this all the time people come into the studio that are desensitized in a way and you know just from general body awareness they they're running into more people in the bathroom or in the hallway or they're you know they walk in with their shoes even though Mike's the shoe police and take off your shoes they do it anyway and you know all of these um, little things that that happen when you are desensitized and if you practice this this awareness of feeling your body and oh okay I feel like this today or maybe oh, hi, how you, doing? <laughs> uh, you know practicing feeling and then once you feel it's a whole knew, oh my gosh, I feel my, my insides today don't feel as well as I did yesterday. Maybe I'm a little tired or maybe I have a little bit more energy today, so it's okay to do this. And, you know, just really becoming sensitized instead of relying on, you know, all of the external information all the time to, uh, to tell you what to do. Um, so once you feel, then you have a choice. You can say, okay, I feel something, I'm going to freak out and like pretend that didn't happen, <laughs> you know, or you can believe in what you feel and say, well, you know, I feel something's happening for me, and I'm going to tell a great story at the end about, it relates to fertility, about this woman who's been coming to the studio for a while who has a, a very happy ending story of following how she feels that um, gave her the result she wanted in her life, and a lot more. Um, so she chose to believe what she feel and then uh, respond to how you feel, so creating a habit of doing something about it. So I'd say, okay, I feel like this. I'm going to believe that because I have power and I have the confidence. And the more I do it, the more confidence and power I'm going to allow myself to have. And then responding. So I'm going to create this daily practice of whatever it is for you. You know, we don't, you don't have to be, you know, coming to the yoga studio every day. But if it's, you know, doing five minutes of meditation in the morning or, you know, shopping for more greens or more plant-based foods or taking a walk on the beach or just having some time for yourself. And you're going to find all these different ways that, uh, that are really holistic and really um, exciting and inspiring for you. And, and the neat thing is, it's, it comes in many different forms. It can be, it can be cooking. It can be yoga. It can be, you know, dancing. It can be anything. So that's the that's the broadness of it. One of the things I think is super uh, important and interesting about ease is that it's critical chemically in your body. It's critical hormonally in your body. And we see a, a couple of different worldviews often. One is people uh, will look at the world like it's a tough place and you have to push and crash and struggle over barriers to, to get to anything, to achieve anything. And so that's, that's one way. And another way is just thinking, hey, um, what I am, what I have is enough. It's what I need. And my job is not to go to war and to fix what's bad about me. My, my job is actually just to learn to work really well with what I've got and that that's enough and that that's not a matter of pushing and forcing and struggling, um, that that's a matter of ease. And on a chemical level, this has to do with balancing the stress equation in our favor. So one of those worldviews, the first one, the struggle-based one, 
balances it against us. It sends stress rushing into our bodies, uh, and stress then makes a home in us. It stays. Um, of course, stress is always going to be out there, but it's what do we do with it? The other worldview, the one of, hey, I'm enough. I just need to get really good at working with what I am, because of course, if I'm going to achieve great things, it's going to take all of me. That all of me is good, it's enough, but it's going to take all of me. If you take that worldview, that tends to balance the stress equation in your favor. Stress might come, but it gets to keep on moving. And that's critical for all kinds of reasons in your health uh, systems in your body. Uh, it triggers, among other things, the relaxation response that Herb Benson talked about beginning in the 1970s. And I got to spend some time studying with him. And it, it, this whole cocktail of really important things that switches your body over from defend against the world, protect myself against injury mode, into healing and health mode. And the more we can, we want to be in that healing and health mode and ease uh, in how we go about yoga and then translating into how we go about life is incredibly important for that. So the, uh, the third principle that seems to come up all the time, uh, people talk a lot around Stroll and a lot with you about making friends with their body. Um, so maybe you could talk to us about that. Sure, along the lines of, of ease is really, you know, realizing that all of our bodies are different and that's fine. Just you look at nature, it's trees, everything's good. <laughs> you know, you don't want to hang out with a tree that's the same as the next tree next to it. And this really comes down to exploring in our bodies. And it's, it's nice to see this this little side-to-side -side wiggle that you've really introduced into <laughs> what we've done. You know, yoga can be sometimes very controlled, very exact, very rigid, and you know, it's and, and also not work in that way. So it's not that yoga is some magic potion that can cure you and heal you. It can if you use it as a tool to explore, to allow your mind to be relaxed and not tense and easy. Um, you know, so in, in no means am I saying, like, just do yoga and, and that's great. It's how you practice. And uh, if you can practice in an exploratory way where you're, you're easy on your body, you're easy on your mind, you're gentle on yourself, you're moving everything all at once, everything you can in all directions, and, uh, and really being okay with that and having a good time and, and not worrying about the person next to you that's doing a handstand and say, oh man, I can't do that, you know, or doing this, and, you know, Cindy's here, and she's like, oh, I can't do that. <laughs> but Cindy's able to do all these cool things because she's exploring in her body, and, and that's the other neat thing about it. When you do explore, you're going to find a lot more with a lot less effort, and whether that's, you know, working on yoga, or whether that's working in the kitchen, or whether that's working at your job, or working on your family, all of these things are going to come very easily with a lot less effort. And, you know, I've experienced this in my own life from, you know, growing up doing ballet and thinking that everything has to be perfect and, you know, having my own struggles with food and my own struggles with life and then saying, wait a minute, it doesn't quite have to be like that. What if I just allowed myself to relax? What's the worst that can happen? Maybe it doesn't work. <laughs> you know? Maybe the tense way is the best way to go and it's just not working for me for some reason. I have to stick with it and struggle through it. But when I started to relax and find that ease, everything opened up for me. Um, my life opened up, my yoga opened up, you know, anything I wanted to do really opened up. And the things that I thought I wanted to do that weren't what I wanted to do really became more clear. And, um, you know, again, there is always stress, but you're able to deal with it a lot easier. And so it is really effective. <laughs> I like to think of Strala from my mountaineering background as an explorer's club, except instead of exploring mountains, people are exploring themselves. And I, you know, I think um, uh, a lot of times we talk about, um, bringing it back to baby, infant spinal development uh, around the studio. And when a baby is first born, uh, you all know that the spine is in a C shape. But the shape of our spine is a double S curve. And the way that happens is actually by exploring. So at the first thing baby does, baby learns to pick its head up. And that's the first little curve that develops by movement, by exploration. Second thing baby is doing is baby's scuttling around on the floor in every direction it can. And then the baby's on hands and knees going and you know, not following the rules that was, were told to the baby in a yoga studio about how you must do poses, but actually by exploring easily in every direction it can. And then running around and, and, and exploring in that way. And that's actually how a healthy body is created, how healthy alignment and proper function is created, is by exploring. 
And that doesn't change as adults. What happens to us as adults is as we you know, get in front of our computer all day, instead of a, a development of a healthy body, we have a degeneration of a healthy body. And at the same time, just like baby had the complete ability inside of baby to create everything that was good and proper, we still have that ability. And that's what people are finding everywhere is as simple a principle as making friends with your body, moving everything you've got easily in every direction you can. You know, not, not so much just this, although if you find this fun, that's fine. <laughs> but really getting into like everything you can move all the time, every day, it's like breathing clean air and eating good food. Yoga like this is something that you can do every day very happily in your body to great effect. And this, this making friends, not going to war with yourself, um, like I think is, is common in fitness. If you make friends with your body every day, you're going to see good stuff. And you have a great example of these three principles in our friend Christine Zilka, who uh, maybe just share her story if you can. Sure. So I shared Christine's story in the January conference, and I'm just going to share it briefly again because it's so powerful, and it just continues to be amazing. We've kept in touch with her a lot. So. Okay, for, Christine's also a writer, so she's written a nice um, post about it, so I'm just going to read that for you. What happened over the next year and a half was life-changing. In order to tell you what changed, I feel like I should tell you a little bit about my relationship with my body. I've had a painful relationship with my body. In fact, I wanted to divorce myself from my body. It had let me down in so many ways. I had assumed it would always disappoint me with a matter of pain. I was not nice to my body either. I starved it, I purged it, I hurt myself in retaliation and in pursuit of control throughout my teenage years. In my late 20s, I was diagnosed with PCOS. It was an undiagnosed until a few years after my husband and I tried to conceive. When I saw my ovaries on the ultrasound, my first reaction was, they look like a pomegranate cross-section. They were filled with dozens of unpopped eggs, cysts, if you will. <laughs> I cried when I found out, not because of grief, but because of relief because I had found a name for what was wrong with my body. That I had been chubby and sluggish and moody was not out of lack of discipline, but because of a hormonal imbalance. That the root cause had been there all the time. I cried because I was angry that I'd gone undiagnosed all those years, and because the side effects of PCOS, easy weight gain and difficult weight loss, could have been mitigated. I had engaged in needless war with my body and myself. And so I had renewed hope. I exercised, I ran, but you see, when I worked out, I was like a fainting goat. I'd still run and want to pass out and strenuous weightlifting. It wasn't that I couldn't lift the heavy stuff. I'd put my mind to it and push through the pain and I'd go home with a migraine. I did stadium stairs and I'd vomit 14 times in an hour. My personal trainer high-fived me for pushing through the pain each time. I loved backpacking. I backpacked the Lost Coast and I backpacked through the Sierra Nevadas at altitude. My friends and I got used to the fact that I got altitude sickness before everyone else and that I'd just puke up the mountain. <laughs> And then I had a stroke in December 2000, 2006 at the age of 33 due to a PFO, a hole in my heart as a fetus that I was born with. We breathe through our mother's blood and so we have no use for our lungs. The blood flows from one side of the heart to the other, skipping our lungs through a hole in the central wall. When we start breathing air, that hole is supposed to close and route our blood to our lungs, but in about 20% of us, it remains open to varying degrees. A small percentage of us have migraines due to that hole, and even a smaller percentage can have a stroke. On December 31st, 2006, I threw a clot in my brain and had a left thematic stroke, one that left me with a 15-minute short-term memory. Doctors closed the hole in my heart a few months later. I was finding restricted, I was restricted from exercising until I healed. I was Dory the Fish in Finding Nemo. I couldn't read anything other, th other than People magazine for months. I couldn't read a novel for a year. I couldn't write fiction for nearly two years. And when my heart was ready a year later, I began running again in earnest. I could run, I could breathe, I couldn't believe the freedom. There was still a lot of healing left to do. Doctors are amazing, but after my stroke, I learned that medicine can only go so far. That last mile is a lonely road that doctors often do not take alongside you. My neurologist told me, as his parting words, you've come a long way, you're lucky to be alive, but this is as far as I can take you. He was a wonderful neurologist who said this with the greatest empathy, but it was the truth. This was as far as he could take me. The rest was up to me. And I pushed forward. I wrote every day, hoping to regain my ability to write, and I did. But you see, it wasn't until Strala and Tara that I finished healing. 
When everything came together, my mind, my body, that last mile, my relationship between my mind and my body, that I realized there shouldn't be pain in wellness, there should be ease. That this new ability to breathe could connect my mind with my body, that every breath could heal. I spent a year not running. I thought, what if I just do yoga? What if I just really let myself enjoy my body? What if I slow down? To reiterate, there was still a lot of healing to do, stuff I didn't even expect to have healed. My husband and I were still struggling to have a child, I'd taken progesterone, taken fertility medications, lost weight, taken metamorphin therapy. It had been a 13 year long road, one not without its share of let's give up for a while and let's try this or that again. And I guess our life would be fine if we didn't have a kid conversations. I was approaching 40 and the door was closing. In the meantime, I was going to Strala. In the beginning, I trembled during warrior two, but I take a deep breath, think of water, think of my body floating in water and take a deep breath, exhale, transition to reverse warrior, breathe, hear Tara's voice in my head saying, easy, breathe, slow. <laughs> I was going to Strala. I did crow. I couldn't believe that then when the time came, I could barely balance, I could balance my body on my knees. I took a breath, not forced to do so. I was going to Strala, where change was happening every single minute without pain and without struggle. A work acquaintance of mine told me, Christine, if it were easy to be fit, everyone would be fit. Working out is supposed to be hard and painful. At the time, I nodded, but today I shake my head. It doesn't have to be that way. I happened to drop 15 more pounds over the course of my year at Strala. When I wasn't in New York City and I was in Berkeley, I popped in some DVDs and did yoga at home. I happened to start eating better, not because I didn't eat my chair of junk food, but I found myself having a few bites of chocolate and then stopping when I had my fill. So many things just happened to happen without yoga, with yoga, that it couldn't be a coincidence. I happen to be happier, I happen to be more confident, and this spring, I happen to become pregnant. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> I didn't go into pregnancy without risks. I had chronic high blood pressure for a number of years and was at risk for pre-echolepsia. The first thing doctors did was take me off blood pressure medications. I'd been taking for 10 years and I was a little worried. Every day during my pregnancy, I took my blood pressure. It never went above 125 or over 84, and on the days or day or two after I did yoga, my blood pressure stayed at or below 115 over 75. I happen to no longer need blood pressure medication. Without medications and with yoga, I happen to no, no, no longer have blood pressure as high as 160 over 120. Yoga kept me and my kids safe throughout gestations. I happen to not have morning sickness. I happen to have a completely textbook pregnancy. I'm now 38 weeks pregnant, a milestone I never thought I would reach. At this point in pregnancy, I'm uncomfortable but healthy thanks to yoga. I did yoga until the end of week 32, which in layman's terms is about eight-ish months. <laughs> I did everything I could to get pregnant over the course of 13 years. I know deep in my heart that it was yoga that happened to be the variable of change. It was yoga that brought my body into balance and I could see things become regular in a way that they hadn't been before. I'm not scared of labor because I'm going into it with a strala philosophy of breathing and moving with ease because I now have faith in my body, and this is how Strala has changed my life. So I'm super happy to report that Christine gave birth to her baby just a couple days before the conference in January. <laughs> Very convenient for me. <laughs> so a textbook, amazing delivery, thanks to yoga. And there's Christine, and there's Penny. Christine, <laughs> so the neat thing about this is you really are how you practice. And the goal, when Christine shifted the goal from trying to lose weight, trying to get pregnant, trying to get better blood pressure, and just switched it to having fun and feeling good. All of her goals actually happened easily without her thinking about them, which was kind of cool. We might have time for one or two questions, so do you want to shift to that? I'm here with the mic, if anybody wants to ask. This is, go on. Does anybody have a question or so? Hi. First of all, you're so inspirational. Thank you so much for this. So many great things we're tweeting, and we love what you're saying, and it's so inspirational. How do you, you know, I have women in my family who have had kind of lifelong bad habits, mm -hmm. and they're in their 40s and 50s and moving on. How do you, how would you tell me to help them get started to kind of shift their thinking and, and their diet and yeah. to go to yoga? Yeah, no, I think, um, you know, I tried with, I grew up really healthy. Um, you know, my parents are like, I call them straight edge hippies, so we had garden and all this stuff. And then the 90s happened, and everything in our house got replaced with, my mom was into this fat-free stuff and all this stuff with chemicals. And um, so I was eating it along with her. And then I stopped and started feeling better. 
so I'd go home now, and I, I, I first started to say, you need to do yoga, you need to eat vegetables, you need to do all this stuff, and it completely ruined our relationship for several years until, um, you know, she was hearing me, but, you know, nobody wants their relative to be lecturing them and to be coming at it, and that was the last thing I wanted to do, but I just wanted to help. So I started to make it more fun. Um, I said, hey, how about we go and get something and, and, and cook together tonight, and we did that, and, um, and now we're trading recipes again now, and all of her stuff is, is great, and she's doing yoga at, at home with somebody that, that she likes there, and she comes to the studio now and, and does it with us, and um, I think just giving them that space so they've come up with it on their own is a good idea instead of, uh, of the, you need to do this and you need to do that, so I think sort of, you know, maybe bring them to a class together and, you know, have them buddy up and do it with somebody. It makes it more, um, more fun and like they're not being told what a rule is from somebody else. So I don't know. I just found that's work for me and my my parents <laughs> and my family. Any any other questions? Yeah. Okay. One second. Ah. Let's see how am I going to get across there? Hi. Without doing yoga and just doing breathing exercises, does, does that help as well? Because, I mean, I don't really have time for yoga, but sometimes I do breathing exercises to kind of ground myself. Is that acceptable? Yeah, that's uh, totally acceptable. <laughs> yeah, perfect. I think the more, you know, I've noticed just for myself, especially the more regular you are with it, the better. I mean, so creating a habit, whether it's, you know, three minutes in the morning, right from bed, you just sit up and kind of lean against the headboard and breathe or whatever your routine is, just keeping it regular. I mean, yeah, by no means do people have to, you know, be in a yoga studio trying to put their feet behind their head and do a bunch of crazy stuff to, to be, you know, live happy and healthy and connected lives to your own intuition. So that's great. Keep breathing. <laughs> Any any other questions? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, I think the I think the question is when is your next book? Oh, what a, and when? It's a, it's about food and it's coming out. It's called Make Your Own Rules Diet and it comes out September of next year. Okay. I have I actually have one last question. I think that. Um, you know what's scary about sort of confronting or facing infertility is that you don't know what the outcome is going to be. Yeah. You know, it's you're like you're, you know, it's kind of like jumping out of an airplane. You just don't know where you're, where you're going to land, what it's going to feel like, and what you're going to find, at the end of the journey, no matter what that end looks like. What would, would you have any advice for people in terms of, you know, how do you, how do you embrace the unknown, with strength That's and with a big ease? One. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and maybe you know, I'm not sure there is an answer to that. But how would you, you know, if if, if someone were to come with you and say, I'm having a really difficult, I'm struggling with sort of moving into this phase of my life where I don't know what the result is going to be and I may never achieve my goal. How do you, yeah. how do you find the strength and ease within facing well, I, that? I think when Christine came to us, she was coming and I just thought she was another, you know, she's like, oh, I'm stressed, whatever. And then I got to know her for a while. I never like, oh, what's wrong with you? Do you have any problems? You know? <laughs> but she came to me and said this stuff. And, you know, for her, we had a good relationship. And I just said, you know, take it easy, you know, just be connected to yourself. So I think the, the more things you can do to make yourself feel good and strong, then you realize you have, you know, your own, you know, you're still alive, you're still a person, you have your family, you have your support system, and, you know, you, you're much more clear with your range of options, no matter if, you know, your specific goal for today, if that's, you know, getting pregnant and having a kid works out, or if you're, you know, if you're going to adopt an army of, you know, African babies or whatever, whatever that turns into being, I think, um, you know, just having that, that strength in yourself to, to be okay is, is a good basis point. And, for what I do, all I can help people is be strong as themselves and so they can make their own decisions and see what happens. Because it is completely unknown what's going to happen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think what Christine right. did is she had the goal, then she let it go and she got into herself right now. And we see that work with so many people. It's not that you have to be goalless, but everything you're ever going to do is going to happen from right where you are. And you have to get really into that. And people make such good use of that. And they end up going way past their goals, I found, um, you know, just with, you know, with other topics of, you know, work life and emotional life and physical strength wise, people just focus on themselves and focus on their practice of doing whatever it is. And all of a sudden, when they're not even noticing all these things or great things are happening in their lives. So I think that that happens a lot, which is hopeful. <laughs> yeah, that is hopeful. <laughs> right. I think that might be all we have time for today. So thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>